Good morning. morning. Happy Happy Easter. And then this is something we love to do each year. It's that call and response that Christians do around the world that says, this is a big deal. My phone has kind of been blowing up this morning, like with this uh, phrase that comes through, he is risen. And then somebody says back, he is risen indeed. So we'll try that just a couple of times. Uh, He was in the tomb three days. We'll go three. All right, let's go for that. He is risen. He is risen. risen He He is risen. He is risen. We love that. We love to celebrate that in this place. Listen, if you're like, what is going on? Hang in there. It will make sense as we go. Uh, We have something to celebrate. That is true. And listen, listen, listen. This is not just a once a year thing for Christians. We celebrate every day that Jesus is alive. He's alive. He rose from the dead, conquering death, the grave for us so that we could have this beautiful experience of new life with him. We love it. We love that. And so there's something I want you to see. Pay attention to that phrase this morning. I want to begin with a little video. Let's show that. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. I love that the resurrection is at the center. By the way, did it bother you that the words were going up? It did. That was bugging me. That was bugging me until it became clear that through the chaos Jesus is at work and has been at work, and his plan will not fail. That's good news for us. Amen? Amen. And so here's what the question we want to answer today. Why is the resurrection such a big deal? I heard this again this past week. It was part of our our life group curriculum. If you've been a part of life groups, you might have heard it as well. The death rate is 100%. It's a big deal. That someone would be able to defeat death, we need it. We need it, and this is the one, the one who has conquered death. Jesus has done it, and he's able to give us life and life everlasting. True, don't ever grow tired. Don't let anybody run it down. Never grow tired of hearing what Jesus did for us. 
And so today on this Easter 2024, we want to take a good look at the resurrection, and we're going to look at that from his word. If you have a Bible, would you take it out? If you need a Bible, would you raise your hand? We'd love to give you one. If you need one for a friend, we'll give them all out today. That'd be great. We're going to be in the second half of our Bibles. We're going to be in the gospel according to Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapter 28. And if you find that, that's where we're going to be camped out today, looking at the account of Jesus conquering death. Uh, Today, uh, if you're using our app, uh, you can see that. uh, Josiah already mentioned that. It has the notes for you under Sunday. You can follow right along. And as we do that, I want to make sure I say welcome and good morning to those upstairs, those downstairs, those at the garage, and those online. I love all that God is doing through our people right here across the valley, across the world as we gather. And we're going to be in Matthew 28. Be ready for this. Because you're meant to see some things this morning. You're meant to see some things this morning. Here's what it says. See this in Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, that Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. They went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Wait, I'm going too far. Got too excited. Got, got ahead of myself because I just, I'm like, let's get there. Let's just go verses one through four. How about that? You're like, you went too far. <laughs> went too far. Here's the thing you have to understand as we come to this account today, you have to remember what has transpired over the last couple of days. Jesus was crucified on Friday. And after his death was verified, please pay attention to that, by Roman soldiers, highly skilled executioners who do this for a living. Why why is that important? It's important because some have espoused that Jesus didn't really die. Some have said that he just fainted on the cross and the cool of the tomb revived him and then somehow he rolled the stone away and escaped. That is thousands of years old. And that is not true. Jesus conquered death. He didn't just faint. The skilled executioners made sure he was dead. And when he died, this is what happened next. His body was taken down. It was washed. It was wrapped by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, two prominent followers who had kept their love for Jesus hidden for fear of the Jewish authorities of whom they were a part. They placed his body in a new tomb owned by Joseph. New tomb, meaning nobody else had ever been placed in that tomb before. The tomb belonged to Joseph of Arimathea, and a large stone was rolled in front of the opening, sealing it. But that wasn't enough. Still on Friday, the Jewish leaders came to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and said this, we want you to seal the tomb. We want you to go ahead and put a wax seal on it so we can know if anybody has messed with it. And then beyond that, this is what we want you to do. We want a guard to be posted because the Jewish leaders, I find this interesting, they understood that Jesus claimed that when he was killed, he would rise again in three days. They understood what he said. They knew what he claimed. And so they ha- there it is on Friday. The tomb is sealed. The guards are posted. A lot happened on Friday. Then Saturday. Saturday passes slowly. If you've ever noticed this, when you're looking forward or you're just... In uh, a tough place, time seems to drag. Saturday passed slowly and silently, filled with grief, filled with anxiety. And then Sunday arrives. Look out, because all that happens on this day, on Sunday, will overwhelm all that took place on Friday. 
Now, this is something where I, I stop and I, I want people to, to use their minds as they understand this. If you've ever struggled with how Jesus could rise on Sunday, you say, well, that's not three full days. If he went into the tomb on Friday, it's not three full days because we as Westerners, we are trained. We are trained that a full day is 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day. Jesus needed to be in the tomb 24 hours a day. And if he's not in there 24 hours a day, it can't be real. That's the way we would see it, but we would not be seeing it from the perspective of the Eastern mindset and how they calculate time. If Jesus were in the tomb any part of the day, he was in the tomb that day. It counts. It counts. To be in the tomb for any part of the day means that day counts. So let's just, let's just say he was put in the tomb on late Friday afternoon. He was in the tomb all day Saturday. And at the beginning of the day on Sunday, he's been in the tomb three days. Three days. And I want you to know now, as we look at this account, it is Sunday. It is Sunday, the first day of the week. And I, I want you to see this. There is a lot to see regarding the resurrection of Jesus. And don't miss it. You, there's so much detail, we won't get it all today, but you need to see some of these highlights. You need to see it for yourself. Here it is. See this to begin with. See that the women are going to the tomb. See that they are, they are after it. it is early and they are on their way. We learn from other gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of those gospels. They each share uh, some new and interesting details about his death, his burial, his resurrection. They, they fill in the gaps for us. We learned from other gospel accounts that these women had prepared spices. We, we learned that they prepared them Friday night before the Sabbath began at sundown. That is a Jewish way of celebrating every week. They, they celebrate that Sabbath, and then they had to wait. No more preparing of spices, no more preparing of ointment, no more preparing anything. Now they are forced to wait. Uh, I would ask for a show of hands, who loves to wait? I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands. Who just says, I love waiting. No. I love waiting in line at the grocery store. I love, I love it when there's only one checker <laughs> at the self-checkout. <laughs> I love it. No, we don't love to wait. It was hard for them. It's hard. I, I don't like to wait for microwave popcorn. <laughs> Says something about us. Stand by, because here's what happens. The waiting is over. The waiting is over. It says that the, the women were on their way to see the tomb. They know where the tomb is at. The question is, would they be allowed, would they be allowed to give their spices and ointment and put them over his body and say goodbye? Another question for them is, who will roll the stone away? Who will do that for us? We can't make that happen. Who will do that? And then this account. As they're approaching the tomb, it says, Behold, there was an earthquake, a great earthquake, not caused by what we know through science, not caused by plate tectonics, not caused by fault lines slipping past one another, not caused by anything happening below the earth's surface, that you cannot see at that time. It is caused and told to us right here that an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and the ground shook greatly because of this. There is something happening here. I, by the way, I would have you write something down next to that, next to verse two in your Bible. Here's what I wrote in the margin of my Bible. The resurrection is meant to shake us. It's meant to shake us. It's not meant to say, hmm, that's something. It's meant to shake you. And so I want you to see what happens next. See the women going to the tomb. See the angel roll back the stone and then sit upon it. Like nobody's touching this stone. Nobody's, nobody's touching this stone. The angel rolls back the stone, by the way, not to let Jesus out. He didn't conquer death and then get trapped. 
That's not how it happened. The angel rolls back the stone to let us in, to let us see, to let us examine, to let us look and see for ourselves. The angel rolls back the stone. It describes his appearance. Here's what they see. His appearance is like lightning. That means what you can see, his, his skin, his face, his hands, his feet. It is like lightning. His clothing is as white as snow. You would need a welder's mask to look at him. I don't know if you've ever seen a welder's mask, but there are no welder's masks listed in this account. Did you agree with that? None. It's not there. The guards who were there, still there on Sunday, there have been guards there posted since Friday evening at the command of the Roman governor. They still have guards on duty that morning. The guards who were there on Sunday morning, it says they they became like dead men. They passed out. They were doing their job and then this happened and they were unprepared for it. The ground is scattered with guards like dead men. And then see what happens next. See the angel speak to the women. And this is where I got carried away. I wanted to get to verse 5. Here's what it says. Verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Fact. He is not here, for he has risen. Amen? Amen. He is not here. He has risen as he said. Come, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See I have told you so much seeing going on in this passage, a lot of seeing Matthew 28. I love this statement, by the way, don't you love it when the angel who has frightened the guards to death, frightened them to a point where they are passed out and littering the ground. He says to the women, don't be afraid. How many of you would say too late? (laughs) That's too late, too late. Say that first. Get to that first. Too late. Uh, he, he says, don't be afraid. And now, I love this. The guards have passed out. The women are standing. The guards have passed out, and the women are standing. And this is so good. I picture the women, though, in, in this way. He is so overwhelming, this angel. Skin like lightning. Appearance like lightning. Clothes as white as snow. I picture it this way, that they would have had to shield, cover their face, maybe even face the ground as he spoke to them, as he said to them, do not be afraid. And he tells them these things. I know, I know you seek Jesus who was crucified. The angel is not unaware, he is not uninformed, and neither are the women uninformed about what happened to Jesus. There is no mistaking who they came to find, and the angel says, the crucified one, the one who truly died, did not just faint, the one who has been in the tomb for how many days? One, two, now three days, just as he said. Just as he said. The angel is speaking to the women. And then I want you to see this very clear invitation to them and to us. See the invitation to come and see where he used to be. Come and see where he was and where he isn't. Come and see what is less than a spectacle because he is not there anymore. I love this invitation by the angel. Still seated on the stone. Nobody touching this stone. Nobody touching that. Come, enter the tomb. Go ahead. Go ahead and enter the tomb. Go ahead and examine where his body used to lay. Go ahead and check it all out. Because he is risen. I I wrote these words down. Examine, view, and here's our scientific word for the day. Observe. Observe. Observe for yourself. Observe. Take it in. 
He is risen. Come, see. This idea of come and see, I have to tell you, is not just found here in the resurrection account. It's found throughout the scripture of your invitation to come and check it out for yourself. Psalm 66, verse 5. Let's put that up on the screen. I just want you to see this. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of men. Come and see. By the way, that come and see what God has done. We sing a song around Christmas time. Noel, come and see what God has done. Come and see. Check him out for yourself. See and believe. Then how about this in John chapter 1 where Jesus is calling his first disciples and some of them are ready to see and believe and some are like, "Mm, I don't know. Here's what it says in John 1 verses 45 and 46. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, (laughs) can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Philip said to him, here it is. Would you say it out loud? Come and see. Come and see for yourself. Philip saying, don't take my word for it any longer. You go ahead and use your good mind that God has given you. You take it in and see if Jesus of Nazareth isn't the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophet spoke. Come and see. I, I, I love this because even in calling those first disciples, they are real people. They have among them skeptics with snarky attitudes. I'm so glad the Bible doesn't hide any of this from us. It's not just looking for like, I'll believe. There are some that, like Nathaniel who said, hmm, I don't think anything could good come from there. If you're a skeptic today with a snarky attitude, listen, you're like, that's me. If you're a skeptic today with a snarky attitude, the invitation is exactly the same for you. Bring your skepticism Bring your snarky attitude and come and see. Come and see. One more place that I want you to come and see along with Jesus. John chapter 11, verse 34. He is coming to the tomb of his good friend Lazarus who has died. Here's what it says. And he said, Where have you laid him? Where's the place? Where's the tomb? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Come and see it. Come and see it. Jesus then goes to the tomb of his good friend Lazarus. And following John eleven thirty four 34 is the shortest verse in your entire Bible. John eleven thirty five, 35. Jesus wept. When Jesus came and saw what death does to his loved one. He was moved and he wept. What was happening there? Jesus saw what death did and he said, this, this will not do. If you understand what happened next, Jesus called Lazarus back from the dead. Jesus showed his power, his resurrection power that he didn't have to wait for some future day to raise someone from the dead. He raised Lazarus that day. And now today we are at Matthew 28. And it's no longer Lazarus' tomb that we are gathered at with Jesus to see. We're at the tomb where Jesus was and the angel invites the women, come and see for yourself. They were there and the angel says this, come and see. And then he has a secondary word for them, a secondary phrase, a statement. It's an action statement. Come and see. And once you've examined, once you've observed, once you've taken it all in, then go and tell. Go and tell. I love that these women are history's greatest tattletales. They could not keep it to themselves. They could not. They should not. They would not. They went on to tell the disciples, 
Go and tell what you've witnessed here. Go and tell what you've seen. Go and tell what you've examined with your own eyes and taken in with all your senses. By the way, anybody th- focused on the spices anymore? The ointment, is it, is it any more of a factor? It is not. It is no longer a factor. Look how verse 7 concludes. I love this. Verse 7, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. And then, like he's finished his job, see I have told you. I have told you what I was meant to tell you, and you are now meant to take over from here. Matthew 28, verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb, and I would urge you to underline this in your Bible, that these ladies are real, with fear and great joy mixed together, and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. Verse 10, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Exactly what the angel had said. Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will, anybody, see me. There they will see me. So the the women are saying, we see you. This is not some hoax. It's not an illusion. It's not in our heads. We see you for who you are. All these emotions running at the same time, fear and great joy, those can be woven together. They are in this very instance And then in the middle of that fear and great joy, Jesus met them. You know, there was something about going into the tomb and seeing that it's empty. Going in and seeing where he was, where his body did lay, and that it's gone. And that there's something so much greater to see him. To see him. The tomb empty, that's amazing. To see Jesus, that's miraculous. And so we come to this, and I want you to understand this today, that you are meant to join with Mary and Mary, lots of creativity in the names, with the women there and then the disciples, and you are meant to see for yourself this fact, that the Savior, that Jesus, the Christ, Jesus, the long-awaited one, Jesus who was crucified and placed in the tomb for three days, see Jesus is alive. And I would have you do this. If you have a Bible around you that you can write in or just, or, or just know this, when he says in verse 9, greetings. Greetings. I wrote in my Bible, insert your name here. That he greeted them so personally. He came to them and they were able to see him up close. And he said, greetings. And if you read some of the other gospel accounts as they, they weave this all together, there's a lot of details that are happening here. But I don't want you to miss that Jesus would want to greet each and every one of us by name. The risen Savior would want to greet you and welcome you into his family as you put your faith in him and see that he's alive. That simple phrase, greetings, it's not a big deal. It's a big deal for someone who was dead and is dead no longer. Dead in the tomb for three days. Dead no longer, never again. Greetings. Listen, today, if you gathered here and you say, I put my faith in Jesus. He's my king. He's my savior. He's the one I call Lord. He's the one I want to follow with my life. I know him. And he calls me by name. Then Jesus would say this. Now you, by name, invite others 
to come and see for themselves, including the skeptic, including the snarky, including those who say, no, it's not scientific. Come and observe. Come and observe for yourself. In fact, I, I want you to think about the gospel in this way. Maybe you have it. Uh, it's, if you're using the app, it's there for you. If you were given one of these uh, flyers on your way in today, the gospel. The gospel. Gospel means good news. Here's what it means. Gospel means good news. When we break it out into an acronym, because I know you're like, I love acronyms. Gospel means this. G, God created us to be with him. You need to know that. O, our sin, all the things that we think and say and do that are against him, separate us from God. S, sins cannot be removed by good deeds. You cannot do enough good to outdo the things you've done wrong. That's preached all over the world. That's called karma, and it doesn't work. You cannot outdo the evil, the wrong. P is for paying the price for sin. Jesus died and rose again. E, everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Not life just for a little while, not just a better life. Eternal life. New. Life that's eternal is L. That means we will be with Jesus forever in heaven one day. Until then, he gives you his spirit to live inside of you. He is with us until we're with him. Listen, never grow tired, never grow weary of hearing the good news of what Jesus did on our behalf. He died in our place. He was buried for three days. And he rose again, conquering death. Listen, I, I can't go any further than to say if you don't know Jesus or you're just simply in the, I don't know, I'm uncertain, I'm not sure, I don't have a confidence in this. Today, Easter Sunday, what a day for you to receive the greeting of the Savior and receive the forgiveness that he offers. I want to just lead us in a, a time of prayer and we're going to put this up on the screen. This is not a magic prayer. This is a prayer of confession saying that I just, I, I, with my head and my heart together, I want to give my life. I want to give all that I am to Jesus because he gave all that he is for me. If, if, you're, if you're ready to receive Jesus, right where you're at. Pray this with me. Jesus, I believe that you are God. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead to give me new life. I confess that I am a sinner. I accept the forgiveness that you offer. I want you to be my Savior and Lord. I invite you to come and lead my life Amen. Amen. When you surrender your life to Jesus, he's saying, greetings. You were meant to be with me. I came for you. I died for you. I was buried for you and I rose again for you. And this is the way it should be, that we would be together. Would you do this right now? Would you just uh, stand right where you're at? And we're going to get ready to sing and praise and celebrate with Christians around the world, with people who are coming to know Jesus for the first time today. We're going to celebrate this. And let's begin with this. I'll say he is risen. You say he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen. Let's sing and celebrate the God who saves. Happy Easter.